Hi everybody, my name is Brooke and I'm a geologist. Today we're going to talk about basaltic rocks. Basaltic rocks are one of the most abundant rocks on the Earth's surface and are also common on the surface of our moon and other rocky planets in the solar system like Mars. Because they're so common and have existed throughout most of Earth's history, being able to identify and interpret basaltic rocks is key to understanding many important geological processes and how they have shaped the story of Earth and other rocky planets. I'm going to use the terms lava and magma separately in this episode because they are slightly different things. So magma is liquid rock at depth deep in the earth where it is under lots of pressure. As the magma rises it starts to cool down and crystals will begin to form and sometimes they'll drop out and get left behind and sometimes they'll stay in the melt and get carried up towards the surface. This begins to change the composition of the remaining melt, the magma. As the magma continues to ascend the pressure drops further and then volatile material begins to leave the melt. So volatiles are things like water, carbon dioxide, fluorine, sulfur, hydrogen and a bunch of other gases and liquids and solid non-metal solids. As a result the melt that reaches the surface has a slightly different composition to the melt that started the journey so they get different names. So it's magma when it's at depth deep in the earth and then it's lava when it's at or near the surface. Basaltic rocks are igneous rocks, which means that they crystallise from cooling magma or lava. Because this is an introductory video, I'm going to concentrate on the things that we can see either with the naked eye or with the lens or the microscope. If you're interested in more advanced geochemical and mineralogical aspects or in things like unusual textures and unusual types of basaltic rocks, let me know in the comments and I can make some more videos on them. To be classed as basaltic, a rock must have a high proportion of the minerals plagioclase and clinopyroxene, which are known as the essential minerals because they are essential to the classification of the rock. Basaltic rocks also contain a number of accessory or varietal minerals, which allow us to further specify the type of basaltic rock that we're looking at. Common examples of varietal minerals are things like olivine, hornblende, biotite, rutile, apatite, zircon, magnetite, a lot of different ones. So basalt that contains lots of olivine, for example, would be called an olivine basalt. Basaltic rocks can also be classed as mafic because they are rich in iron and magnesium bearing minerals. And mafic is a short way of saying magnesium and ferric iron rich. Basaltic rocks are often called basic as well in some older books and papers because they could only be dissolved in strong base or alkaline solutions. There are a lot of jokes you can make about basalt being basic, so have fun with that. So there are three basic. <laughs> types of basaltic rocks which are classified by the size of their mineral grains and these are the ones that you're going to encounter most commonly on the earth's surface. Like I said this is a basic, in <laughs> there we go again, basic introductory video so don't jump into my comments saying but bro where are the Kamatiites? There are three basic types of basaltic rock which are classified by the size of their mineral grains. This is also useful for helping us understand how and where these rock types form which is pretty neat. Even though the grain size changes, the mineralogy and chemistry of the basic basaltic rock lol, remains mostly the same. Obsidian has the smallest grain size of basaltic rocks. In fact, it may not have any crystal grains at all. This is because obsidian is lava that has cooled so quickly, the crystals didn't have time to grow. Rapid cooling tells us that the rock formed on or at the Earth's surface. And we know from watching modern volcanoes that obsidian usually forms where basaltic lava erupts out onto the land or into the sea or into cold, wet, shallow rock. Because it has no crystals and an amorphous microstructure, obsidian is a type of glass. This homogeneous structure causes the conchoidal fracture and the sharp edges that make obsidian so effective as using as cutting tools. Basalt is the second most boring rock on Earth and has the next smallest grain size with the crystals usually being microscopic but it definitely does have crystals in it. The space between crystals might also be filled with obsidian glass because the parent lava that produced the basalt cooled too quickly for more crystals to grow. In this case the lava may have started cooling at depth where crystals formed and then migrated closer to the surface carrying earlier crystals with it. Because basalt cools more slowly than obsidian this gives crystals a chance to grow into their preferred shapes which are called euhedral but they'll still re remain relatively small. Basalt generally forms on or near the surface where it's erupted from volcanoes or intruded into existing rocks as dikes and sills. Basalt can also have a variety of interesting textures and we can look at that in another video so if you'd like that let me know below. Dolerite, which is also known to some people as diabase, is the next smallest grain size. Crystals in dolerite are still small 
but you can see them with the naked eye, and especially if you've got a hand lens or a, a microscope. Crystals in dolerite are still small, but you can see them with the naked eye if you've got a hand lens. So that's not really the naked eye, is it? You can also see them as well quite easily if you've got a, a stereo microscope like mine back there. Dolerite intrudes into existing rocks at shallow to moderate depths, which is what allows the slower cooling and the larger crystals. If you look at a dolerite intrusion in the field, you'll notice that the crystal size increases towards the centre of the intrusion. And that tells us that cooling is faster at the edges of the dolerite, where it's in contact with relatively cold and quite often wet rocks. A similar textural change can be seen in basalts and other igneous rocks as well. Some basalts on dolerites will even have glass at the margins of the contact where the, the cool, instant cooling occurred, usually in contact with wet, cold, sedimentary rocks. So we call this a chilled margin, so look out for that when you're looking at these rocks in the field. Gabbro has the largest grain size of the basaltic rocks that we're talking about today, and that's because Gabbro intrudes deep underground and cools slowly, giving the crystals plenty of time to grow nice and large and into their preferred euhedral and sometimes even idiomorphic, which means they're perfect shapes. The textbook shapes. Gabbro crystals are easy to see with the naked eye because of this and if they've got a lot of plagioclase in there you can be easy to mistake them for a type of granite. Some gabbro can be spectacular such as this labradorite gabbro which is rich in iridescent labradorite feldspar. Really difficult to say labradorite that quickly that many times. So there's our introduction to the basic basaltic rocks, the most common ones that you're likely to see. So how and where do basaltic rocks form? Well, you probably noticed a trend of the crystals getting larger as we go deep into the earth. And that's because basaltic rocks crystallize from basaltic lava and magma that originates in the earth's mantle. When you look at a diagram of the earth like this, you might think that the mantle is totally liquid because it's colored orange like lava and magma. But in fact, the mantle is actually mostly solid with only a small fraction of it being liquid at any time. When we compare basaltic and mantle rocks, we see that they are related, but a bit different. Mantle rocks are ultramorphic, which sounds like a Dragon Ball villain, but actually it just means that these rocks are very rich in iron and magnesium compared to regular morphic rocks. The difference in chemistry tells us that you need to melt around 15% of the mantle to produce a basaltic magma. You're probably wondering now how we actually get rocks from all the way down in the mantle. Well, one way is that we find bits of mantle rocks inside basaltic rocks. In this example, the green chunks are a type of rock called peridotite, and that's a type of mantle rock which is rich in olivine, aka peridot, and chromium diopside pyroxene. Peridot was ripped out of the mantle and carried to the surface by this basaltic magma and then the lava that that transitioned into as it surged upwards during an eruption. So bits of other rock in an igneous rock are called xenoliths, and this type is called a mantle xenolith, and that literally just means an alien rock. Because the melted rock is hotter and less dense than the surrounding mantle, it rises towards the surface and then either erupts in a volcanic system or becomes a subterranean intrusion. A sill forming there. It's very thin, very thin sill, it's very thin. Now, you might be thinking, but Brooke, if I was a supervillain and wanted to generate basaltic magma and lava, how can I do that if the mantle is already hot but solid? Well, there's a couple of ways we can do it, but my observation suggests that geological supervillainy never works out well for anyone, least of all the supervillain. So the obvious way to generate 50% mantle melting is to increase the temperature of the mantle. This is not that easy as the mantle is cooling and the heat is there is generated by the radioactive decay of elements that have been down there since the earth formed. However, there are localized areas of intense heating within the mantle that we call mantle plumes, which can generate melting. There are mantle plumes under many volcanic oceanic islands like Hawaii that are a long way from the plate boundary where you normally expect to find volcanoes. Another way to melt the mantle is to lower the pressure of the mantle in a localized region. This produces something called adiabatic decompression, adiabatic, that is a difficult word for me to say, which generates heat and then melting. That's why we find lots of basaltic volcanism at ocean ridges and in areas of rifting. As the crust splits, the pressure drops in the underlying mantle and melting occurs. Magma is generated and rising, which may produce volcanism on the surface. The hot buoyant magma generated causes the area to rise up, reducing the pressure even more and producing yet more melting and magma. And that's why the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, for example, is the longest volcanic chain on Earth. It's an area of low pressure where the plate is splitting apart and generating a lot of melt that's rising to the surface as undersea volcanoes and hydrothermal vents and whatnot. So there we go, a quick introduction to basic basaltic rocks. If you'd like to know more about basaltic rocks, such as the different textures enhanced by semen and under the microscope, how to identify the minerals, phase diagrams and how we understand the chemistry of these rocks, and 
other more exotic types of basaltic rocks, then let me know in the comments. Likewise, if you have any rock questions or want to look at a particular geological topic, then stick that in the comments as well. Click on the video next to my head to learn more about how basaltic rocks form oceans, or one below that about how to identify the feldspar minerals that we find in basaltic rocks. Until then, see you later, stay safe, have fun rock nerds. Let me know, but I'm such a dork. The dark lord of geology. Adiabatic. Adiabatic. Oh, big scorpion fly outside sat on the window. Most geologists are mentally 12. I am such a massive dweeb.